sociology, this will be my call, and uh, I started sociology, and uh, I talk a little bit about self-confidence, because what we do later in life, and you are all high achievers, you know, to be, you're all in an arena where we usually don't find necessarily too many women, so confidence to achieve what you 
also has achieved is a key cornerstone, I think, of all what we do. Um, but it is not a given, and it is not something uh, our dowry, necessarily our dowry, we bring with us or we get at a certain point in our lives. And uh, when I grew up and when I, I entered university, I was this very ambitious girl, always sitting in the first row and always eager to perform, mm -hmm. but always having this feeling that uh, maybe they find out that they shouldn't be there. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I mean, I saw it with my colleagues, with my friends, they all outsmarted the, the boys. Uh, but at the same time, never being, you know, too vocal about it, you know, be, still be womanly and be, you know, you wanted to be desired by the other, by the significant, potential significant others. Um, and um, at some point I thought this has to stop. And I was very afraid of talking and hearing my own voice. And that would lead me later to the work we're doing now. So what I did, I forced myself, I gave myself a task, raise your hand during the lectures at least twice or three times. And even if it's just asking what the time was, may I leave earlier, just to hear your voice and be there and be present, show your presence. So, you, know, you see the baby steps we're taking. And in the end, you know, I was uh, my professor at that time, it was a very feudal system at the university, you had a professor, head of the department, and he asked me to become his, uh, his assistant. And then I, made, uh, I started this university career. But uh, then the women's movement came, was in the way, and I saw how male-driven the whole setup was, and I was too curious, you know, to explore the world, to explore the social problems. And I came across the burning issue of uh, violence against women, particularly domestic violence. So I got very much engaged in this cause, and I thought, all the tools we have as uh, young sociologists, we can, we can apply, we can serve, you know to kind of make this tangible, this problem, and show the scope of it. And uh, so it's not just a social problem, it's a societal problem. And uh, I applied for a fund at the National Bank, that they have a special funding scheme, and to, to everyone's surprise, and the most to my surprise, I got this pitch, and uh, I could do this project with a small research team. And to my surprise later, the university was very uh, ashamed, you know, that I was kind of tackling these unscientific issues. So I had a really hard time. Uh, then I became so uh, already a bit rebellious to so the women's new movement and the, the women I met alongside, they said, why don't you turn into the book, you know? Let's pay back time. Now they're giving you a hard time, but you know, it should be discussed on the board and it became a runaway bestseller, uh, very nice revenge. So revenge is sweet. I think we should really learn this as women. <laughs> never give up and never step back, you know? Uh, and never say you're sorry or regret anything. So this is how it started. And uh, I became, I realized over the years that, uh, that, um, uh, that, empirical, that, that the empirical tools we have as social scientists, as, as sociologists, they are potential tools for change. You know, that if we collect evidence, uh, we can kind of uh, open the space for change. I got very interested in this, and uh, I was closely watching, uh, you know, ongoing uh, political affairs. And there were two, uh, I think, two developments which really, uh, yeah, I left university. That was unavoidable because, fortunately, this is about mentorship, and I, I'm sure you mentor younger women who are hopeful and on their way, and this is so important. And um, I found a, fa a fabulous mentor. She was the then minister for, uh, for uh, science and uh, science and arts, I think. It, the, the labels and the ministers are shifted all the time. At that time, she was the minister for science. That was her portfolio. And at some point, she contacted me and she said, uh, I see, uh, I, I'm running a research foundation. Uh, it's a big foundation. And uh, I see the potential you and your team could bring. You're still very young. Uh, it's an all-male setup, and if I can break through these uh, potential barriers, I would like to you to have this uh, this institute under the wings of this foundation. So she was successful, and uh, I must say this was an ongoing experience in my life. Uh, there was always a lot of support coming from women who already made it. You know, who already did. that was fantastic, you know, really a great experience. I, I'm totally grateful. And uh, I think she often did not agree, you know, with, with the more outrageous things we propagated and how we voiced the stuff at that time, be more very um, ex 
excited about uh, you know changing not, uh, not only the society but our, our personal lives and the gender interactions. So, but nevertheless, uh, she was smart enough and mature enough to let some things go. So this gave us the opportunity to do more in-depth re research, and I think there were two major challenges that led me to the work of women the borders. There was the Bosnian, uh, the, the Balkan wars, and that was so close to home. And I think I, I just mentioned it because we're in a similar situation now with all the refugees and the raging wars, not only around us, they are more distant, but even closer than what we experienced at that time. Because at that time, we still had the feeling we can handle it, you know, we can, it's, it's uh, you know, it's kind of not so, it can be contained. But I saw these incoming refugees, and I immediately addressed uh, a research fund and said, I see this influx of refugees, what I see is that the majority of them are women, so shouldn't we document where they come from, their experiences, and uh, we got the go ahead. And I went to this, the city of Vienna was great, they put up these uh, containers, they built new containers, they housed uh, uh, ten thousands of refugees uh, over the weeks, uh, it was done in a very proper way. And I went with my team to talk to these women and to develop this research project and collect evidence, <coughs> collect the experience, so I thought they are witnesses of history. But uh, we were not prepared for what they had witnessed, you know, all the abuse. And they wouldn't talk for us for days. So there was no way the lips were sipped. And we knew very little at that time about uh, the situation of uh, women on the global stage, and gazed women, refugees, women who lost everything. It all seemed to be very distant still, you know, not related and connected with our lives. And uh, only after a few days I thought, I see all these children, you know, clinging on to, the, to their mothers. So we went to the toy stores and brought stuff and started just playing with children and with our translators we started talking. Then all of a sudden the women smiled, they opened up because you win the heart of your mother when you interact with a child. And the stories they told us then, the stories almost each and every woman was raped. And it was almost impossible to talk about it. And what we realized then, that rape was such um, a disputed issue that these women would not <coughs> ever mention it vis-a-vis -vis officials. So we had to find a space, you know, where they can talk, where they find, uh, you know, where they can be heard, where they can talk about it without shame, that it was not their fault. And uh, over the years, uh, we worked with, uh, with, uh, with these women and I saw that, you know, uh, continuously working, seeing the leaders coming out of this group was so important because what uh, they achieved then, with all the support we could provide, that rape was, uh, became an official uh, reason for asylum, an official, an official reason, an official, they could make the case. Yes. So extremely important, you know. But if you don't sit with these women, work with these women, it's a long process. I mean, the international players, they are so busy with their shuttling diplomacy and whatever is going on, it's important, but they don't have the the inroads, they don't have even the idea, you know, uh, they don't have the language to interact with these women. And it's not just these women, this is about civil society, this is the fundament of the societies where, you know, families are rooted and uh, security is built up. So for the first time, I had this feeling this is about security, also about security of these societies, of the Bosnian, of the Serb societies, which will bring now the women from both ends together they maybe can reconcile, of course. The next big learning experience was uh, Afghanistan. Um, it, was, it was kind of, I stepped into this, um, into, uh, into the Afghan challenge uh, by accident. Uh, I was asked uh, uh, to, to do a, a, we were asked to do a, a project around the refugees in the, in the centers, in the, coming out of Afghanistan under the Russian occupation, there were three million refugees uh, in, um, along the border, the Afghan-Pakistan border, and, and at the foot of the Hindu Kush. And it was really interesting. Also, mostly, mostly women, millions and millions of women. But these women, I mean, talking was out of question, you know, uh, interacting with them was so difficult because you could hardly reach them. They were kind of sealed off. And all the international players were outside of the camp, you know, providing 
everything they needed. Uh, but then I looked at the distribution center and what it saw were a lot of small boys. They came with their identity cards representing their mother, picking up the food and the necessities, you know, for survival. Because the women could not be photographed and they didn't have an ID or anything. So they didn't have a face, they didn't have a persona, nothing. So this was the first thing that struck me. Um, so we worked, uh, with, worked our way into this situation, and then it became more about how we interact or don't interact with uh, the women who are targeted by war and, and, uh, and uh, you know, revolutions and uprisings. Uh, how do we deal with it? What, how do we interact? Usually we don't interact. You know, we leave it with the international community. Uh, very much at that time represented by male actors. And uh, we started then developing, after we did interview, what we always do with our native partners, with our uh, local um, uh, people who helped us to make inroads, teachers, uh, health workers, we went to the tents, we spent months and months with the women. And uh, then we started developing programs, you know, so that, uh, you know, the health tent would not be in the middle of the center, where the women could not go to without male company. And sometimes the little boy was just playing somewhere and uh, the mother uh, was ready to give birth. And uh, we had cases where they bled to death because they could not reach the, the medical tent. So I, it, we felt, you know, these things have to be voiced, have to be, you know, changed. And of course there was a lot of support, but it has to, you have to kind of I think it's like the elephant in the room, what is not working, and everybody's dancing around it. Good intention people, but slowly something, you know, happened and uh, a lot of international players and more women got involved and voiced their concerns. Uh, but I will never forget one quote. Uh, I was there with an Austrian team, uh, and there were also researchers and a doctor and so on, and I said, wouldn't it be valuable for you also to have access to women in ways when they have, you know, uh, they are, we were thinking of, you know, doing entrepreneurial projects. They had a lot of qualification in, you know, handicrafts so to make the day shorter, uh, create storytelling rounds, you know, do all of all of these things. And it would be also valuable for you uh, guys to meet these people in the camp and uh, interact with them. We can provide translators or whatever. So slowly, slowly, we made this inroads, opened the 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 doors to the tents. And I will never forget uh, a very renowned um, um, uh, professor. Uh, he's uh, long, he's gone meanwhile. So uh, he said, um, oh my God, it is one, one of your knitting clubs again. One of your knitting. So for them, it was the knitting club approach, you know. But knitting clubs very often work, you know. And this circle of women, they bring change. We can see that all levels, you know, this is a circle of women. You know, meant to bring change and bring you together, and they are, they are on all different levels. So, um, this was an, an interesting experience. Uh, the Afghan experience and the experience of these women uh, who suffered the raging wars there, you know, the rebels, the uh, jihadism on different levels, never left me, and then the Taliban took over. But there was no way to go there, to go to Afghanistan. But I think it very much had impressed me and it led to the foundation of the borders. Uh, I always saw, you know, I heard these testimonials of women coming, you know, uh, there were uh, massacres in the stadiums. Women were shot just because they were women or just because they had le le uh, left the house. Or the Taliban would set an example against women and Im impose gender segregation on all levels of society. And on one day, one of these women landed at my doorsteps in Vienna, interestingly enough. There was this, I already knew about the Revolutionary Association of Women of Afghanistan. And uh, she was invited as the PR person of this organization to speak in the Hofburg here in Vienna. And uh, Gorbachev was here, it was the men's awards. She was invited to speak at the men's awards. And uh, Gorbachev was here then, um, um, it was uh, um, some I, I can't, uh, some celebrities, some some Hollywood celebs were there. They were all, all honored, you know, to contribute to change and be brave men out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the invite the inviting group thought it would be fabulous to have, uh, you know, Gorbachev and then a woman in a burqa on stage. 
and have a brief interaction. And she agreed because she thought she would raise money for the hospital they were supporting now. And uh, they, want, they, they had this interaction, uh, and I didn't know of it, and it went well. And they wanted to send her back the other day. So she said, well, you know, being a brave Afghan young, bold woman, she said, wait a minute, I'm not going away. You know, I'm, I wasn't flying here to entertain you. Uh, I expect something in return now. Very good. So this, you know, these people in the movement, these women in the movement, they speak out and they understand, you know, how to deal with authority and power. Uh, so they were quite helpless and they knew I was working in these issues and I got this phone call from the organizers at 11 o'clock in the evening. And they said they are completely, you know, they're completely lost with uh, this woman. Um, and they dropped her at my door the other day. So they already agreed to house her for another week. And then uh, I had the privilege and the pleasure to be with her, to accompany her through various hastily put together fundraisers, you know, with uh, well-intentioned women's groups and uh, we also made the inroads with our politicians. But what I heard then really deeply impressed me and never left me. She shared with me how the women in the African underground uh, kind of uh, kept civil society going under the most uh, incredible circumstances, unlikely circumstances, how they, they didn't know how long the Taliban would stay. She came during the Taliban reign. So they decided to keep on going to teach their children. So they assembled the children in their living rooms. They split up the children in the neighborhood, in small neighborhood groups, in, and uh, brought them to their living rooms. At the beginning, uh, they brought the books with them, you know, so they were beaten up and mistreated and the women were persecuted who gave, were intended to uh, agree to give these lectures. So then they were smarter and they came without anything, you know, they worked without anything, without uh, paper, without pens, without anything. It was all over, you know, over a very long period of time. Uh, they uh, were not allowed to, uh, to go to the hospital anymore, you know, the health workers. So they also organized, you know, ways how they could look up the women and help them in their living rooms at home. How to persuade the men to allow it, because the men were also very, very afraid. They said, you know, I might lose my wife, but maybe the children uh, will survive if the authorities, the Taliban authorities, won't become suspicious. So they worked all kind of out all kind of systems and kept civil society going. They said we can't lose our whole generation, you know, not educating them, not taking of the health issues and so on. And what they also did, they created these films, the underground films, and sent them out to the world. And I think that fortunately helped to oust the Taliban because the world stood up against this regime. At the same time, it provided a case for war, you know, to, to invade the country. And we have, it was the unfortunate, you know, first unfortunate, uh, I don't know, whatever, but this is too political. We stay in the humanitarian phase. Um, so this kind of really impressed me and the next thing I saw was uh, that we embarked on another journey to Afghanistan which kept us there, engaged there for quite a long time uh, with her, with, with this wonderful woman. Um, we went uh, back uh, and uh, she opened all doors, not in Afghanistan, it was impossible during the time of the, of the Taliban to go there. Some very, very brave uh, correspondents were there, and also female correspondents, but I think we wouldn't have contributed anything, we would just have been in the way. So we decided to, uh, to, to uh, be at the border in Pakistan, uh, Peshawar, the area where, uh, that I knew quite uh, well, and they started uh, gathering material, again, uh, started a research project with us, and they brought us the material, we learned about a lot about the situation, and I will never forget this moment when I envisioned them, you know, when we said goodbye in Peshawar and I envisioned them how they would walk over the Poros. The border was open, more or less. You could walk back and forth, you know. I envisioned how they went back and I saw their flowing bookers and I thought, women crossing borders, they are women without borders, you know, borders don't apply to them. And that was the very moment, you know, of women without borders. So uh, that's how it started. Uh, uh, we registered, I think, about uh, uh, already more than 15 years ago, and uh, at the very beginning, it was uh, it was uh, much about empowerment, looking at uh, countries in crisis and uh, transition. But we did not. It, empowerment was the core issue. We worked with uh, women in Rwanda, 
uh, we thought it was a very instill is a very good example of uh, women's empowerment and what women can achieve. Uh, we continue to work in Pakistan. We did a huge project with the support of uh, the Austrian government. Uh, we uh, created a manual uh, for uh, the first elections. Uh, in cooperation with local NGOs and the Revolutionary Organization of Women of Afghanistan. And it was very simple about what is a vote, what is a box, you know, ballot, uh, all these things. Uh, training sessions were created, uh, and this was fantastic. Then UNFPA took it over and printed it in 10,000 editions and, and distributed it in the local languages across the country. So that gave me a lot of confidence that actually uh, out of the box, out of the form, formal setups, you know, of intervention, of internationally driven uh, organizations, which are often too big to be connected, uh, you know, they are not as flexible, that with direct interaction and connection with civil society, we can contribute, and big organizations who have the capacity and have the funding can take the stuff over and, and, uh, and kind of roll it out. So this, I learned a lot from this experience. Uh, we also learned how to work underground. Uh, we saw that uh, domestic violence was a huge problem and uh, it wasn't safe for women to go to uh, the first centers, uh, the first uh, counseling centers that were set up uh, by UNFPA and other organizations and uh, you know, CARE and they were all there. It was very difficult. So we created a vocational training circles where women came from the region and we made sure that they couldn't go back. It was, you know, too far to, from their home to go back. And actually, these centers were shutters. So they learned something during the day, but they could stay safe there and uh, got counseling and got medical treatment. And then, you know, strategies evolved. Would they go back? Would there be negotiating uh, measures and so on? Okay, so this is the whole pretext of women uh, borders. This is how it started. Um, and we already had a lot of confidence, you know, from this experience that uh, together with the women who want to see change and who want to tackle uh, issues uh, 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 that um, make their lives difficult, uh, we can join forces with them. And we in the West have a lot of experience. We have gone through all these, uh, you know, uh, developments. Uh, in parallel or before, we, but we had the chance to con connect experience and connect with each other. And this, and I felt this connection has to be made on a global scale. For this reason, women without borders, we are in this together. This was the whole idea. I make a little jump. Um, um, when 9-11 uh, happened, this was certainly a life-changing event uh, for all of us. And um, this was for the first time where security, in terms of what role do we women play in the security arena, was, for me, was totally, you know, where I realized that women are not represented as security stakeholders. And when we think of security and we look at the security pyramid, it's always up there, you know, with law enforcement, with politicians, with uh, yeah, but never there, actually. It's never bottom-up security, it's always top-down security. And for this reason, uh, the top is not really inhabited by, uh, by uh, masses of females. For this reason, it's also a male affair. Uh, so after 9-11, I had a very interesting experience. I read in a Vienna coffee house, I was sitting one morning, and I read this little note in then still the Herald Tribune, International Herald Tribune, that uh, Aisha al-Wafi, the mother of Musabi, Sukaraya Musabi, uh, who uh, trained to fly into the towers, was pulled, the boy was pulled out because his visa conditions were not in place. So the authorities became sus suspicious of him. But still, he was a potential perpetrator. He was the so called 19th, 20th hijacker. Uh, his mother, uh, who lived in France, who raised him in France, um, they are of uh, Moroccan background, uh, reached out to the mothers of 9-11 uh, who had lost family members, and she said that she felt very sorry what her son was about to do. And she can feel the pain of the other mothers. She can identify with them. And 
a few of these families came together. It must have been an incredible experience. Uh, when I read this, I thought, this is a dialogue. You know, if they really respond and mothers from the other side, mothers of victims respond, this is the dialogue that will really change the picture, you know, of violent extremism, terrorism. Uh, the mother of a victim and the mother of a terrorist, you know, interacting with each other and trying to understand and come to grips with what had happened with both the children on different ends of the scale. So, uh, a, a mother, uh, in, a mother from New York, White Plains, New York, uh, responded. Phyllis um, Rodriguez. Uh, she's a teacher and an artist. She lost her 32-year-old son, Greg in the towers, who was an IT person. And she responded, she met Asha, and uh, I contacted, I, I found out about it, I contacted them through, I don't know, the Herald Tribune or CNN, or wherever it was traveling, this news was traveling. It was a very short news, a very brief news bit. The world did not really pay too much attention, but I thought this is really big, you know, this could be change, you know, bringing change to this debate of security. So we invited both, when I found them, we invited them both to Vienna, and uh, we started uh, discussing with them, and uh, it was incredible, you know, this, we had a conversation, we had a lot of private conversations, but we had one big conversation in the book, in the Fox Theater, you might all know it, in the theater, it was a matinee, our prime minister opened, because it was, you know, around 9-11, and uh, terrorism, and these women were holding such an incredible dialogue. You know, Aisha said, I'm the mother of a terrorist, and it's incredible that you're talking to me as the mother of a victim. And uh, Finley said, it must be much harder for you to talk, because the sympathies are not with you, they are with me. So this, you know, and I immediately sitting there understood the inroad is, the explorations of the unspeakable, the explorations of the territories we have never explored, you know, the territories of the other, the victim's territory and the, and particularly the perpetrator's territory. Because now we can demonize the terrorists, we can demonize the families, this will not bring us anywhere. We have to come to terms, you know, what drives them? How, what did the family see or not see? This was the first time I asked this question. Aisha, what did you see and what did you not see? You will see Aisha then on the film I, uh, we have uh, brought with us. So this was uh, actually the um, uh, opening another arena, the arena for Vimeo Borders, the security arena, and uh, we called for a global meeting. We fundraised uh, for quite a time, and we called for a global meeting. I felt it is time for a security platform. We called it Safe Sisters Against Violent Extremism. Uh, sisters, because I still felt, you know, this is connected to the women's movement experience. Create a big circle, create uh, this sense of sisterhood, you know, whether we are on opposite sides, but we have this one world in mind, you know, a peaceful world, and we can, if we talk honestly, we can, we have a chance to create something or to walk into this direction. And violent extremism, because, you know, uh, terrorism was very much now on the agenda, all of a sudden, security was uh, was still a very main domain, so I thought this idea of, you know, women coming together, sharing the space, uh, exchanging experiences, and talking about what is happening uh, at their home fronts, you know, where they raise the children, uh, would be very important. We had a meeting, the first meeting uh, in Vienna, it was, uh, it was a great experience, uh, and we, I already saw, I, re I recognized that we need the recognition of the official stakeholders as well. If, you do it, if we do it just as, um, as um, civil society stakeholders, there will be a certain disconnect, you know, all these civil society people. So we made sure that the then Minister for Foreign uh, uh, Affairs, uh, Benita Ferreira Weidner, who later became the European Commissioner, was opening the the session. We had women from uh, over 23 countries, you know, from the Gulf, from Kosovo, from Colombia, from Albania, from Pakistan, Afghanistan, everywhere. We made sure it was not targeting Muslims only. Northern Ireland was very important so that we get a sense of violent extremism, how we are affected and targeted on a global level. 
And uh, we had a three-day uh, working meeting uh, we, uh, where uh, we were sponsored by uh, a, a very nice person who gave us the space uh, in a small palais. And the advantage of this palais was that it was we could lock the gates and nobody could go shopping or running around in the city. <laughs> so we had really three days of full conversations. And it was, um, uh, so we tried to map out the groundwork, you know, what, how can women contribute to uh, security, what could be the charter, what will bring us together, what can the, the country representatives do in their respective countries. And this network actually was kind of, uh, it stayed together, it became much smaller, of course, you know, because people, when it comes to real work, not everybody stays on board, but a core group stayed on board and became very passionate about the work and is still uh, together and is now expanding, you know, in various ways, you know, there's always a certain dynamics. Um, and during our meeting, uh, Mumbai was attacked. There was this horrific attack on, on the city of Mumbai, across Mumbai, we had these bomb explosions. We had an Indian filmmaker with us and she said we have to go, immediately go and uh, uh, look what is happening there. I will volunteer to do a film, and um, uh, this. So one, you know, so many things happened, and we always responded to what happened. We had the film on the victims in Mumbai. Uh, we found uh, uh, women who bravely stepped out of this victimhood arena. There was particularly one woman. Uh, she was the wife of the additional uh, police commissioner who uh, was in the car hunting down the only surviving terrorist, Kazar, and uh, he slowed him down, uh, but uh, was shot in return for his brave act. And his wife watched him on, on, it was filmed, the whole thing was filmed on television. She saw that they were running out of jackets. He didn't have a jacket, a bulletproof jacket, and his K-47 block. So he said, she said, look at this. Kazab is firing instantly, and our guys don't have the right equipment. So she's a lawyer. So she challenged the security system. In the year of grieving, her husband was unfortunately killed. In this year of grieving, raising two adolescent boys who really had a lot of problems in the aftermath, um, she uh, revoked the Act of Information Act and looked into all the documents and wrote this uh, book to the last bullet describing the situation and challenging the security situation of Mumbai. So this is really moving from victimhood to agency. And we made sure that as group that her story traveled, that she could speak about it. And uh, actually this, the situation changed in Mumbai. The authorities uh, took her as a serious uh, player now in the security consultations. So this gave us a lot of hope, you know. I mean, uh, these are all important pioneering uh, actions and activities. Uh, but then I became very critical also of our work that we were more on the responsive side, you know, where there was an attack and we immediately responded, we reached out and we reported, we went there, we created a project. Um, so at some point we thought uh, we really have to, to uh, find, find a system, you know, because these terrorist organizations, what they have, they have a structure. But we, in response, don't have a structure. We're always caught up in surprise. And uh, I was going on the invitation of the OECE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, who are sitting here in Vienna. And their invitation, they invited us for a leadership training. So this was also something that happened. Uh, organizations consulted with us, and we went to provide leadership trainings, and we went into the, uh, into the mountains of uh, Kujan, the second largest city in, in uh, Tajikistan, Tajikistan um, at that time already at the brink of radicalization, a very volatile country for the Soviet Republic. And uh, the significant thing about the country is that 80% of the men are out of the country. They go as guest workers of foreign labor to Russia, mainly Russia. And the women are stranded with their children and have to raise them under difficult conditions, uh, economic conditions, and also ideology, you know, the Wahhabi uh, Salafi ideology was already quite strong when we were there. I saw that the Saudis built up mosques, incredible mosques next to universities, and they distributed, you know, uh, incentives, spread, and whatever the families would welcome, the mothers, and the children, of course, they went not to the schools, they went into the mosques, at the madrasas, and that created an atmosphere that still 
more and more does so in, in, in Tajikistan. It was difficult. And in this, in this session, in this sessions with the women over three days, um, we started talking about their situation, not so much about their empowerment stuff, but where, where did they feel powerless, you know, uh, in their interaction with the children? How did they sustain the situation with the young boys mainly? And um, they, they came out, you know, quite passionate about it. Nobody talks with, the, with them about it. They try to hide everything that's happening because they don't want to, you know, have bad boys vis-a-vis -vis the community, but they feel very concerned where the psychology on board. And, uh, we started discussing with them, you know, uh, what is normal in adolescence. It's a very turbulent time, and he, in a very short, in a, in a kind of nutshell, he explained the stages of uh, child development, particularly the stages through adolescent development, according to a psychological model, uh, Eric Erickson. And I must say, after so many years of teaching in university, I've never seen such an attentive audience coming up with such smart questions, you know, testing the model, learning from it, being so passionate, at the end of the day, they didn't want to leave. And one of their leaders said, what we learned today, we mothers, we need to go back to school. We need to know all of this. What is radicalization? What is normal, you know, outrage? Uh, we need to know this to respond properly. You couldn't have put it better than, I still remember her name, that Rosaria. So this was the birth of the mother's school. So I think we could click. The, we quickly run through the presentation. You will, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, this is here. I overlooked it. I'm so sorry. You know, we did not rush after this uh, interaction in uh, Tajikistan. We did not rush to conclusions. Okay. So, uh, having said that, uh, I was not brave enough to. I, I wouldn't have known, and my team wouldn't have known how to work with mothers now and what to offer them. So we came up with the usual model we have uh, with our usual. A way forward, uh, uh, conducting a study. And uh, again, approaching the uh, research fund, the scientific fund here in, uh, in Vienna, and uh, the question of the study was, can mothers challenge violent extremism? A five-country research study that was before the foreign fighter problem. And here you see the usual uh, uh, setup. We go to, uh, to the houses of these women and collect evidence. You know, start out these conversations, and we we'll have one-on-one -on -one conversations, and then we we'll conduct the survey. In this case, it was quite a, a, a generous grant, so we could afford to uh, run a research with, I think, 1,200, the survey had uh, 1,000 uh, mothers in our survey, uh, five countries. It was uh, Pakistan, Palestine, Israel, Nigeria, and Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland, very important for the history of the conflict, and the European side, you know, how we dealt with uh, conflict and violent uprising, and the other countries for obvious reasons. And the, the questionnaire at three pillars, what, what do the mothers feel, whom do they trust, and what do they need? And for me, the most breakthrough finding was that, uh, that um, they, uh, uh -huh, that's not on the side, that they trust maybe each other. They trust each other, but in a way, they didn't know what to do with this trust. Because they were still trying, you know, to hide what was happening, you know, to show a nice face, everything is fine. But still they felt, I could talk. And many of the mothers said, you know, who, who lost their sons or daughters, they said, if I had talked to Aisha next door, if I had known she has the same problem, we might have come up with a solution. But they did not, unfortunately. Uh, I don't have the trust thing, no. Uh, the trust uh, gap, they trust the men, the household, of course, the fathers. Uh, but the communication, since it's a very gender policed, uh, these are some of the societies are very gender policed, the communication with the men is more difficult than with, with each other. Outside the family uh, arena, they trust the teachers. And this is so important, you know, we really have to work with educationalists uh, and build the bridge. Uh, that's the first step into the public space, educationalist teachers. They that's also interesting, have a very, very ambivalent relationship with religious leaders because they saw a lot of trouble coming from the religious side. So, you know, as we, as 
our governments also tend to do to push the whole problem of extremism towards the, the religious leaders is not the smartest move, you know, because then uh, uh, they are stranded there, even if they are not too religious, or even they, you don't know, you know, how, how this interaction will go. Many of the religious leaders don't dare have it spoken, they don't even speak a local language, uh, they refer to the uh, to the hadiths, uh, to the teachings of the Quran mainly, and not to everyday life uh, challenges, uh, which are the true challenges for the youngsters, and so on. So what do mothers need? That was the second pillar. They want to learn about warning signs, but they all voiced it. We need to know how to do it. Self-confidence was written across the wall. Self-confidence is a key tool. And then parenting skills. We know very little about uh, how to raise children. And uh, meetings with other mothers, and of course, uh, knowledge of religion, so that we have independent knowledge. Um, based on these uh, findings, uh, and we worked on the study over two and a half years, and had many interactions with the mothers in these uh, tested areas, uh, we came up with a so-called model, uh, thinking of Rosario, that we need to go to school, and we saw how much pride women took in education, and many of them have never that never go to school. So that was something very special for them, you know, to have this idea to go to a school. Uh, so we trained facilitators in the respective countries where we started setting up the first mother schools. The mother schools are meetings uh, of uh, mothers um, uh, in an informal meetings in an formalized space. So they be in a community center. They meet sometimes, uh, the first slide was from Kashmir. Uh, they it's not very safe to meet for women to meet in a public space, so some of the women provide their homes. Usually we have meetings of 15 women um, over a period of 10 weeks. It's, uh, we created a manual, we created a, 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 um, the program, and the trained trainers, the local trainers who are trained uh, from the Austrian team uh, with, uh, with additional uh, capacity in the particular countries over three, four days. They roll out, uh, the, they roll out the, uh, the schools. So each uh, local trainer uh, uh, takes another local trainer and organizes these groups of 10, 15 concerned and affected mothers. Affected mothers, those are mothers who have already experienced the loss, who have lost a child to jihadism. And the concerned mothers are those who fear that something is in the making in their families. And they need uh, weekly is uh, over 10, 10 weeks. And they talk about all these things, you know, early morning signs, child development, family dynamics. And family dynamics is important because what we see coming out of these meetings, the meetings are accompanied by note takers, and the note takers send in their notes to us in Vienna, and uh, team members sit with them on Skype and exchange the experiences and ask further questions and. So we get quite a clear picture of uh, what's going on on the ground. And let's say we have trained uh, uh, 16, 16 trainers in, uh, in, let's say, in Indonesia. Uh, they go in, they create eight groups together, and uh, they reach out to 100 mothers over 10 weeks, so that's quite uh, a success, you know, and then they, they continue. It's not teaching, you know, not, uh, not uh, this was the, the picture from the Tajikistan, this is my Rosaria on top of the table, uh, yeah, she's now teaching the women. Um, I think it's very, I think the, the beauty of the, of the whole thing is it's very interactive. They play games, they play case studies, uh, we have for example, a whole session on how to talk to teenagers. I mean, this, all of you are, who are mothers will remember how hard it is to talk to teenagers, you know? So it's quite effective, you know, to discuss this and to discuss difficult topics. Um, here we have uh, uh, our partners in Kashmir. That was so interesting. They always complained that their kids get involved in stone bending, stone throwing, you know, because Kashmir is. Uh, is occupied territory and there are all these tanks and soldiers around and the boys rush out and they just attack the tanks. Uh, the mothers are totally opposed uh, to it and they scold them but they don't know how to phrase it and how to deal with it in a constructive way. And we said, 
uh, first of all, try to work out your energy. You know, imagine you're your voice and try to slow the stones and discuss afterwards how you feel, you know, how liberating it might be for them, what an outlet it might be. So this is what they are trying here, and this really changed the discussion, you know, around the voice. Not that they condone it, but now they understand them, and understanding is the first way, you know, to interact. Uh, this, uh, these are case studies, this is. Um, I think very interesting is our, uh, our work now in Indonesia, our ongoing work. Uh, there we walk more into, into this direction of parenting for peace. So it's not about radicalization, too much about radicalization, that's too scary. And we want to empower the women as individuals, you know, the mother. Uh, to deal with all kinds of challenges, and radicalization is one of the challenges. So nobody feels isolated, and, uh, and uh, the whole thing is really embedded in the community. So we try to create these uh, integrated networks now. Here you see, after the uh, first batch of uh, mothers graduated, the first hundred in Indonesia, this is the graduation ceremony, how happy they are. They would have never smiled and shown this, you know, uh, signs of victory when in our first meetings they were quite shy, shy and thumbed up and you know watched us because they you know they're not they're kind of not used to this and uh, one of them said it's so amazing i'm talking and laughing now uh, before i went to attend the mother's school that you know the guy the voice i had to talk it's amazing so it's so much for having a voice and actually raising it and hearing it uh, they are very formal in creating this uh, these uh, ceremonies, you know, the mothers in Indonesia uh, created a peace march, the surprise was when they came for the uh, ceremony, and uh, there was a peace march uh, with participants of 1,400 villages across the villages where they came from, and they did these beautiful sachets, and they had built up an, uh, a, a stage, and there was a lot of music and dancing, it was just an experience. And this was really a way to disseminate it in the community. So this is our foreign lands, but now we are here in the middle of our problems, it's the foreign fighters. And uh, we, last year we created this meeting of mothers, the first meeting of mothers were affected by the phenomenon of foreign fighters, that children tried to, were actually successfully departed to Syria. And this was very challenging to find these women, but they all came. Some of them knew each other, some of them did not. And it was amazing to see uh, how liberating it was, you know, to have this uh, gathering and to speak to each other and to break through this silence and otherizing and uh, have an honest conversation. Uh, so these are the women. I mean, women from around the corner, you know. It's like uh, they come from all kinds of uh, jobs, social services, teachers, uh, administrators from PR agencies, uh, some of them are Muslim, some of them, some of the kids are converts, quite uh, a mix. Um, so uh, it was, uh, they ex exchanged their experiences, why the children were recruited, uh, why they got, got the sense of value. Uh, I mean, it's very hard, I think, for young people who don't have uh, who, who feel that they don't have meaning in life, that they search for something, uh, that they are not anchored in society, uh, that they are not recognized, maybe they have uh, also in, in some contexts racist experiences. Uh, it's very hard for them uh, to stay on course, you know, and when the lure of the recruiters come to tell them uh, you are bigger than you think, you know, you are valuable for us, you are wonderful, you are unique. Of course, it resonates with the 16, 17 year old. Yeah, these are the messages. You know, you're building up the caliphate. If they would have the chance to work uh, at Google tomorrow, I think they would choose the Google. They would choose Google or the caliphate, you know? But I think they are quite lost. We're dealing with a generation of lost kids. So, the mothers, it's clear of the emotional access, but they need, but they need. To, uh, to have the skills also to engage with them and create meaningful conversations. And in terms of the security strategy, they have unique knowledge. You know, they stay in touch with these kids over WhatsApp, over uh, email, over, over phones. 
And this is incredible, you know, that we let this go. We learn so much now interacting with these mothers, sitting with them, talking with them, meeting them. Uh, no security agent has this knowledge because they learn about the process of radicalization when they keep on uh, going and keep these communication lines open with their children. But they also know, learn about the moment of disillusionment, which is so important for us. You know, we all study how can we bring them back and what happens if they come back and will they ever come back and, you know, uh, what, and at a certain point, uh, they are not, they are not con convinced that they made the right choice. But if they don't, if, if, we, if we now find ways that we can get these testimonials and feed them into the young communities, this would be some achievement. It, we think that the mothers are quite well, uh, 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 well placed there. So our key message here is that uh, mothers have to reclaim the recruiters' tools. Recruiters are investing hundreds of hours in each and every victim in each and every case. So investing time is important. That this is our message to the mothers. You have to have time for your children. You must make time. You have to have meaningful conversations. You have to gain the trust. Even if you're furious, you know, some of the mothers who lost their children, when they called from Syria, they dropped the phone because they were so hurt and so furious. So you have to come, you know, overcome your anger and strengthen this bond. And ideally, you do this before they leave. You know, so overcome your own uh, anger, your disappointment. We all want the best, and sometimes we are so unhappy with our children because they don't perform according to our our um, hopes and dreams. You know, but they might have their own hopes and dreams, and we have to to listen to them. Emotional anchoring. So the key tool for us is listening, listening, listening to strengthen the listening skills uh, uh, of the of the mothers. These are the messages they get back from Syria. I mean, quite telling, mommy, I miss you, I love you. Can you play, uh, buy me a plane ticket? But we're not naive, you know, buying a plane ticket also is a mean of shutting money there. And because they are under pressure to bring something, you know, and uh, this is also a means to support the organization. So the mothers are quite smart. They say, I can support you in other ways, but I can't send you mother, uh, I can't send you money. So the conversation is uh, quite difficult, but important. I do this for you. Many of them who are kind of brainwashed, they, they say this. So you can also go to paradise. And the mother has to take up this challenge. You know, that paradise is uh, potentially here, not there. So we are building these platforms now. We have mother schools running in Austria uh, with groups which are not easy to reach, but through our uh, trusted partners, we find uh, Chechenians. Uh, we did never th dream of getting a whole group of Chechenian mothers together, but it worked, and they are creating a second psyche now. Uh, we have Bosnians, we have, uh, we have Somalians, uh, uh, we have Turkish women in the Austrian mother schools, uh, and a whole new surgery will start. We are working in uh, Belgium, and we started in Belgium before the attacks on Paris. Uh, that was also very interesting, and uh, just at the right time. And the Belgian women are creating now uh, uh, various other groups. Uh, this is the Belgian mother school, uh, the first meeting. In the first meeting, we also had a woman uh, of Bilal in our group who bombed, uh, you know, who who exploded himself in front of the stadium in Paris. And she was sharing with us that he just left for Syria only two months ago, and she was very worried, very, very concerned. Uh, the interactions with the authorities are always very critical and very difficult. We also think that when these mothers now come together, they will be stronger vis-a-vis -vis the authorities to share their stories, insist that they listen to them, get more support. Uh, this is uh, a typical training in one of the interactive games uh, uh, we had here in Vienna. I think this is in where they introduce themselves and speak about themselves. This is a mother's group in Vienna. In the back, you see our uh, Somalian leader. Uh, yeah, where she is in action. Yeah, and uh, finally, I would say that. Um, uh, this uh, is not the primary goal of the mothers' uh, schools. Uh, we are rolling out now uh, across Europe, but the policy recommendations are 
very, very important. You know, that policy shapers listen, and they do. So we can see that, uh, that uh, uh, in the various bureaus uh, who are dealing with uh, counter-dividing extremism issues, uh, from the Home Office in England to, uh, the, to the uh, State Department in uh, Washington, they are very eager to engage with civil society now that the combatant uh, approach, you know, the, the is is obviously not the only approach, so that the so-called soft power uh, needs to be acknowledged and needs to be supported. Uh, and uh, the inclusion of mothers in national strategies to counter violent extremism is very much now on national agendas. Uh, mm -hmm. This is important, I think. And uh, the mothers need the support, but also the officials need the support of the mothers. So it's a it's a win-win uh, situation. Okay, um, that's a film work. We hope so. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Um, as a finale, I would like to bring you some very impressive voices. Uh, uh, they are our testimonials. We've worked with these women over years already. And we started working with them before we even created the mother schools. We have uh, done this film uh, with an English filmmaker. They reflect, these voices reflect the voices we collect uh, we collected over time uh, across uh, the countries which are targeted by extremism. Uh, one is England, so it's right in the heart of Europe. Uh, the other one is uh, is um, uh, is Paris, uh, France, and the other one is uh, Palestine. And you will see a lot of commonalities. Uh, we've shown this film work. Why did we use it as a training tool? And we've more of these features uh, in the mother school uh, movement. Let me click on the screen. You don't see the subtitles of the Arabic speaker. Uh, it's a pity. Yeah. Uh, we can send out all the links. The thing uh, is, uh, it is protected. You know, she's oh, a mother yeah. of a suicide bomber. You could only show it in a protected fashion. Oh, sure. You can send it to those who are interested, you know. Yeah. And uh, there's a uh, code word. Uh, so you can watch it with the uh, code word and then not show it in particularly not in the public space, not on social media. That's clear anyway. Uh, that would be too critical. But I think it's such a pity that we can see, particularly Aisha. You know, Sorry, it's a speaker of. Exactly. For example, this mother of a suicide bomber. It was quite a number of suicide bombs last month. But to speak on on screen and tell us that she is not a jubilant mother of a jihadi. That's quite amazing. And the thing is, we have this perception that the, these women are all the same. But they never have a chance, you know, to even challenge their own the, the perceptions, their own perceptions and the expectations of their surroundings. Mm -hmm. So when they feel that, you know, a platform is opening up, they can own it. They can create something. So some of the mothers now in Hippon are, are coming together and discussing this notion, you know, uh, and how long it was, you know, to encourage some of them encourage their children to bomb themselves or bomb Israeli targets. But 
this has to stop in the mother's eye, very credible voice. But if they feel, you know, they are totally out on the loan there, they will never do it. So this was also a very careful, you know, way to open up a space which is new. And um, uh, the other, the first mother who spoke, she's very interesting, she's British, she can't be more English than Vicky is. And her son, uh, one of her sons is a solicitor in the city, very good, uh, had a good education. Her husband is um, a doctor, uh, an um, Egyptian copt, not religious at all. And uh, she goes to the Anglican church. And the other son had problems with drugs at the age of 16, 17. He was not good at school anymore, skipped out. And then he kind of was approached by some Muslim guys. And he found acceptance there. He, he felt that he was somebody interacting with these boys. They brought him to a very radical mosque, converted. His mother was not uh, against it because she saw that all of a sudden he had a structure. He was clean, not in drugs anymore. She was quite naive, you know. She had, with nobody to share, but she was just happy. Of course, soon she realized, you know, he was wearing this very traditional dress. He was uh, standing up against the usual family routines. Uh, when they had a glass of wine, he became violent. And it went so far that he saw out the television uh, from the house, you know. So these are already, but she did not know too much about the wedding sign. She thought he was just crazy. But he was, I, this was ideology in action. So the women need to know this. Uh, he tried, he, he <laughs> gathered all the material on the internet to create explosives, you can do that. Mm -hmm. And he was successful to create an explosive and uh, had the, the best everything ready. Mm -hmm. And he was ticked off. Uh, and three days before he had uh, tried to so, bomb the Bristol shopping mall. That was everything in his diary. He took out uh, the security exits and everything, you know, the whole plan. Uh, a couple of days, uh, his uh, apartment was stormed, and since then, uh, he's, I think that's eight years ago, he's in a high security in a detention center. But the mother, that's so interesting, she didn't give up on him. She stood by him. She went to visit him and she said, uh, you're still my son, I love you, but I'm totally against what you plan to do. The father went there. The father told him, uh, you are in our family, you are not worth being part of humanity. You know, so, he, <laughs> because the father was so hurt that he, in his role as a protector, you know, he felt he had to, totally failed. Uh, Vicky says at the beginning of this conversation, and I like this uh, entry, I failed as a mother. And I think she's speaking to us, because whatever happens to our children, we always expect that society will ask us this question. Where have you been? What did you do? You know? You were. This is, this is actually what your place to protect. The, the fathers take the blame. The mothers take the blame as well, but the mothers still, you know, this bond is still, this emotional bond is still there, is still strong. And this is so important. This is so important because we can use it. You know, this emotional bond is a starting point. She went to see Andy over the last years, every second uh, week. She's driving across Britain uh, to meet him in his uh, detention center. She said that over a year she didn't touch upon the case of terrorism, but then she started, you know, bringing material, reading material. He uh, enrolled in a course, he did long distance learning, he did his bachelor now in, uh, in German because he was very passionate about learning another uh, language. Also in engineering, I'm not so sure that <laughs> this was a, a smart choice <laughs> for the future. Anyway, we often joke, she jokes about it. Uh, but um, uh, she worked with uh, with uh, with uh, religious leader. Uh, she worked uh, with uh, you know with the social services. So she created, and um, I think a model which is quite unique. Nobody has yet you know to involve family members in this process. And then we go back somewhere. You know, when he comes back, and he will come back in a couple of years, they have to have this place where they can fall back and where they are safe and where the family members are prepared, properly prepared, to, to receive them. So I think also this, she shows us uh, that we talk so much about what happens to the returnees and how we will deal with them. Quite obvious, you must involve, from point zero, you must involve family members and start out with the mothers. 
Um, the other person is Aisha, and she is very strong in this film. Uh, she challenges uh, the religious leaders, and she challenges Islam. She says, uh, this is not Islam, the notion of Islam, the very concept. She says, this is not about Islam, you know. You can't come as strangers and intrude our lives and tell a kid, you know, what is right and wrong. Uh, it's not your place. Just because he is 180 now, you know, a grown kid, still a kid, uh, this is not your case. I raised him, you know, I talked to him. I was, I was there my whole life. You just enter this space now and kind of kidnap him. Uh, this is not going to happen. She, she speaks in a very emotional way, very, very appealing to other mothers. They understand it's like a wake up call, you know. We can't allow this, you know. We are stronger than that. We, are, we need to be stronger than them. We have to stand up. Uh, to these recruiters and to, it's a battle of ideas and ideologies and you have to be up to it. And um, wish uh, another mother is a Somali mother from England. She speaks uh, uh, to the community and she says, uh, you know, we as families, as community have to be strong. They are not Islam. We, we carry the true meaning of Islam, the meaning of peace, you know, the fabric of society which cannot be uh, broken by these uh, guys. Um, so these testimonials are really important because they speak to the women. They speak not only to women, they also speak to the youngsters. Uh, what we think, what we, what our responsibility is uh, to create this moment of ambiguity in the young ones, you know, that they start thinking. Usually the process of radicalization is so fast, the lure is the excitement and also the sense of uh, sudden uh, masculinity, you know, superiority to be somebody, it's quite uh, enchanting and uh, there, need to be, there needs to be a reset button. One of the mothers from the Belgian mother school, is, she, said, uh, she said this with the reset button, you know, it's like they, they press the reset button. Uh, we have to put this to a halt, this process, it's going so fast and the women need to see that they have a place in this and they have the access and they have uh, the passion and uh, I think they are the best security allies. And uh, in, this, um, in this discussion now, in this uh, daily discussion of violence, extremism, radicalization, we don't know where to turn to, but it's starting somewhere and that's the home, you know, it's starting exactly in that space where we don't closely look to, and where uh, policy shapers don't look, security experts don't look, it's all, you know, uh, when we look at this security pyramid, which I have mentioned, it's always looking to the top, you know, what can law enforcement do, how can they ensure our safety and security. It's all necessary, no doubt about that. And the more, uh, you know, safety is created, necessary or not, I'm happy, you know, I don't question any checks, nothing. But uh, I think we have to look where it starts and where uh, we have uh, means of, intervention and supporting these families uh, and supporting uh, this idea uh, that uh, peace starts at home, parenting for peace is incredibly important. Uh, it's about all of us because, uh, you know, the children of other mothers who are not targeted uh, might get the lesson, you know, I have to interact in a meaningful way uh, with kids around me who might be uh, uh, lost and uh, might live in a difficult uh, situation. Uh, bridge building, you know, stepping out of your comfort zone, all these messages are incredibly important. So it's overall about how we uh, live together, how we raise our children, how we look at each other. So I think uh, combating violent extremism doesn't uh, stop with uh, fighting against the bad boys uh, and the recruiters uh, and the evil out there in the world. It's how we look at each other and how we look at uh, what kind of, of, of society we want to create and contribute uh, in creating and we have, a, we have a stake in this. I think this is uh, the starting point and this is uh, the journey uh, uh, we, are, we have started with uh, these mothers. I'm sure there are people who would like to uh, ask you some questions. So can we just briefly open the floor for anybody who wants to say something? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
my name is Susan Cohen. I was at that meeting where Vicky and some of the other jihadist mothers were speaking. And I remember also Hunsdorfer was there and said what a wonderful source of knowledge these women are. And I'd like to know, did he or his um, follow up? Is that yes. anything? Yes. And we make sure that he can't escape us. <laughs> so, will you give us some support? Yes. So, Mr. Hunsdorf is the Minister for Social yeah. Affairs. And, uh, he was hosting the presentation uh, of the mothers, so we could invite them to come to Vienna. And uh, usually the politicians are there, you know, on the panels, and then the lights are out and they are gone as well. But we make sure that he follows up with the support of their mother school uh, implementation. So we've got the means, the, the funding, you know, to do the first cycle now in Vienna, which was fabulous, you know. So the second mother school cycle, the first started in Belgium. The second one started in uh, in uh, Austria, and now the Minister for Foreign Affairs followed up uh, the good example, and uh, we just got uh, funding for the next period, the next half a year, and uh, we will also go in a bigger fundraiser because this is, I think, a, a perfect opportunity for women, you know, to adopt mother schools, or adopt a, uh, a group of mothers to support them. It's uh, it's not big money, but it needs continuity. I think this is very important, and uh, we need to uh, support the, the, the facilitators to run the programs. We uh, host the women. We we have we organize it in the framework of tea time. So this uh, you know is um, cost effective, but still uh, it needs uh, some money. We also accompany the project with research, so we can document the project. That's uh, also important. And we want to expand. Now we are discussing the first father's school, which will be developed here in Kashmir. We got, we got wonderful feedback from the fathers and the and the boys. They uh, the boys came to the mother school meetings afterwards to pick up the mothers uh, to drive them home. And uh, they often said, "So much has changed in our family. We're actually talking to each other. We're so curious what is happening." So we would like to see. Uh, how we can get involved and uh, no, fathers who often gave the women conditional access uh, for, to the meetings, the conditional uh, permission, are very eager to join now. So we are now preparing uh, for the first uh, meetings. The first meetings have happened in Kashmir already. Uh, we do workshops, we explore the situation, but having the, the fathers on board and the boys on board would be just, will be, I don't in the conjunctive anymore. It will be fabulous and I think it's going to happen quite soon. This is something we never, we were not dreaming of, you know, we thought the focus would be, I always wished for an inclusive approach, of course, you know, you have to have to, but it seemed to be so unlikely, you know, and uh, when we look at our own uh, society, how difficult it was, you know, to educate our men alongside our own developmental <laughs> successes and achievements and striving. Uh, I was quite amazed how fast it went, you know, over the last two or three years that that uh, men authentically became interested in uh, learning more because they saw the benefit for themselves. That the women were opening up, that there was a better climate in the house, that there was an engagement, there was a discussion. So they started respecting their wives in a different, different way. Mm -hmm. I got the Vogt, former director, IAEA director in Cyberstuff Lab. We know each other also many years ago. <laughs> That's practically when you started. I would be interested how much is your organization involved in the present situation here? We have in Germany, in Austria, we have this uh, refugee problem. And uh, people coming from Syria, mainly Muslim countries. And I think specifically women who are also a high proportion of the refugees are suffering. I recently read an article about what you said, most of them are raped, have been raped uh, and are misused during their whole, uh, whole uh, trip or journey they are doing. Uh, how much uh, can you become involved there? Because I think these women also need support also the young men, before they get radicalized uh, or change. Uh, and we had seen 
uh, recent events in, 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 in Germany, in Cologne, and, and this is a big uh, societal problem because it actually drives politics towards the right wing, mm -hmm. which nobody probably uh, wants, but um, in the end, I think it is a serious political problem also, and as you rightly said, you need to start from the roots, and these, in the end, are the refugees itself, themselves, in, in the camps. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's very true. And uh, it's interesting, you know, the young men are taking the stage now. You know, these questions around you know, the women and what they have endured and suffered is at the backstage, in a way. You know? mm -hmm. We all look at the perpetrators, you know. Yeah. Uh, we all at the potential perpetrators. Uh, um, I, I do think that a lot of organizations are already taking Caritas and, you know, they are taking of these issues, uh, much better than uh, a decade ago, but still a lot needs to be done. We're all quite overwhelmed with, with what is happening. In terms of the mother school approach with the next cycle, uh, we intend to address asylum seekers, mothers who come from the asylum seeking community, uh, because uh, we, we always reach small mom numbers, but the rippling effect is there. They start talking in the communities, you know, and uh, we are also working now in a, on a model that we, that we, beyond the mother school, that we create uh, cycles where women come together and discuss issues which are, which are you know, close to their hearts and which are difficult. Um, you all know maybe uh, Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In uh, thing. Lean In was hugely successful, but just targeting, uh, you know, high-flying women. This, this circles of women who come together and uh, talk about uh, uh, the difficult situation and how to find solutions and how to connect with each other is extremely important. Um, this film I wanted to show you and I happily sent to you uh, was such a tool to reach uh, women in smaller groups and in smaller groups but spreading out you know, across the whole country. We used this film as um, as a reach out to to uh, women across uh, England, uh, so we trained facilitators to have these kind of circle discussions around these concerns of the women, and uh, they brought them together around uh, in community centres, in schools, uh, after school activities, and over a period of a year we reached five thousand women across England just with this film and a small toolkit, you know, how to lead the discussion, how to facilitate the discussion. And this had an incredible effect across the community. So to have this, uh, I think we have to create, uh, re, re, regain this, this, uh, this uh, approach we exercised in the 70s, 80s, you know, where we had all these concerns as women and came together in awareness raising meetings, uh, discussion forums, uh, this kind of, this doesn't happen anymore, you know, and I do think now it's a wonderful opportunity because all these problems are not problems about the refugees, it's about us. How will we sustain the society? What will Europe look like? What will the West look like? When we talk about values, isn't it interesting to talk about the values on all fronts, you know, to meet these women, discuss with each other, learn about each other. Uh, this is the moment of bridge building, this is the moment of engagement, this is the moment of, uh, of dialogue uh, within our communities. And even, maybe we don't even need a refugee or asylum seeker or Muslim woman, I think we as women need to come together again this, and try to kind of regain uh, uh, this, this sense of responsibility that we actually co-shape our society. We seem to watch the news every day. Uh, I increasingly, increasingly turn it off. It's, you know, after 10, it's impossible to go to bed after the bloodshed and after the horrific uh, uh, messages you, uh, that have arrived in your living room. Uh, but in a certain way, a way we have to process it and have to deal with it. And uh, this is certainly, I think, something we have to get more clarity what can be our contribution and how can we, we can leave it with a politician, you know, as you said, you know, the right wing project is around the corner and it's a real threat and we're being hijacked just like this. I 
Alexa is. Um, you can introduce yourself. Yes. Yeah, so. um, my name is Alexa Greenwald. I'm a program manager, uh, one of our program managers at Blumenthal Borders. Um, I'm uh, my background is uh, I'm a young researcher um, on specifically education and deviance. I was looking uh, specifically at the game structure on the south side of Chicago, um, and there's a lot of overlapping phenomena with uh, violent extremism. So that's my my background. And then we have our trainer, Georgina Nietzsche, and she, what would you, how would you characterize She's her? She's English. She is also uh, trained in, uh, in uh, security, security and social security and development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She works with us for many years. So she was there right at the beginning. Then she followed her husband to some other countries, but she came back as, as it happens. Uh, then we have, uh, um, um, then we have uh, a person who works with us, uh, also a researcher, over 15 years. She, uh, uh, she is very much focused on the work we do in Europe, and particularly in Austria. Uh, and uh, then uh, we uh, have people who come from various universities of, uh, over a certain period of time, because we qualify now as, uh, what do you say, uh, we are part of their practical, practical education. Exactly, yeah, exactly. They come over here, for example, which is really good. Uh, we are a small team. We have an administrator uh, who takes care of the whole backbone of the organization. How many permanent people uh, are you in the We are four permanent. Four, four people here. Just four. Yeah. But the strength we have is that we have our liaisons, our structures in the countries. Uh, they are the people who implement the program, who work with us over the years. For example, in Israel, uh, and uh, Palestine we work over years uh, with the representatives of the parent circle. Uh, that is incredibly helpful. So whenever we start a program, they are on board and they have their structure and they can contribute, you know, by providing their structure. So we don't have to set up any offices, any structure anywhere. Uh, in Indonesia now, we are focusing more and more on in Indonesia. Indonesia is so important, it's the largest Muslim population across the world. And over the years, we made really great inroads. We have, um, uh, an NGO with whom we liaise, and the whole capacity is, uh, you know, facilitating uh, our work with other schools when we go there, and when we're gone, we are still in touch. And then we have one representative uh, in uh, in uh, Jakarta, and uh, we're running away. We're running this mother school. You saw the uh, you saw the pictures. But now we are kind of scaling about it, it up with engagement with police. We do police. Police will be part of the mother school trainings with teachers. We will go there in two weeks and uh, it will kind of you know grow into various sectors. So we will get teachers on board, we will get police uh, interlocutors on board. So we kind our strength is the local connection and the local partnerships we create. This I think is very important because it gives us a lot of flexibility and uh, the, the work can flow into, into the regions. Uh, in Belgium, for example, we were lucky uh, at this meeting uh, um, in the fall that we had very strong, affected mothers on board and they immediately, they were certain workers from their background, they immediately formed these mother school groups in Belgium uh, made all the connections with the authorities, and we closely work with the embassies, of course, you know, we, we, have, we work with the uh, diplomatic interlocutors who help us, uh, and um, uh, we create now this uh, structure for the existing social services. This is the advantage we have in the West, you know, there are existing services we can uh, feed into, they partner with us, uh, and there is always a given structure. This is, I think, the most important part to connect with the existing local structures, so we don't have to create any, you know, any organizations or any build-up. So it is there, it is trusted and embedded in the communities. Very, very important. I think we would do more. We would like to do more with Israel. Actually, it is. It was quite not easy. Yeah. I think it's also important to say that this is a very new topic for social workers. So this is something that social workers are really yeah. eager to receive training on because they're seeing in families that they're dealing with issues of radicalization and recruitment 
and there's very little knowledge on, on how to approach the issue. So it's a really good partnership to work with social workers who are already confronting this, these issues, but not necessarily trained exactly. on precisely how to confront them. Yeah. I don't understand why only four. Just be so passionate. I was really expecting to, yeah. to hear we are hundreds of women around the world just pushing. And I don't understand. The, the core of the organization are four, yes. but you have small groups working everywhere. Yes, yes. It's a question of funding also, you know, this to fund such an enterprise is not in the framework of, uh, you know, uh, more conventional organizations and most of the setups are quite conventional. So you either go into a formalized structure in an international organization, but this would not be... Um, no, no, it doesn't work. That, that doesn't, in that case, it doesn't work. If it work, gets to be, it know, doesn't work, but you need to have more people. Yes, you, um, I mean, we are certainly now, uh, we are trying to expand, we are looking at, uh, at ways, you know, to expand and to have a stronger presence also, a stronger online presence. We discuss this now a lot, and, uh, uh, but the work, the real work, has to be done offline. You know, you can't, you can't do the work online. The online is the awareness raising, to, you know, to showcase, you know, what is there, what can happen, that you can, that there's a place to go. But uh, the the main work is the hard work, is the offline work. Yeah. For normal people, what uh, which would be the field of help that you would love to have? I think for normal people, uh, the wish uh, we have is normal to also women. normal women, <laughs> but also men. Uh, we accept help from men, uh, <laughs> happily, uh, to support uh, the ongoing mothers' uh, schools um, and to support. You know, there are various ways of supporting. Uh, we have fabulous women on board now uh, who uh, I think need to get more engaged on bringing the message out. So whenever I go now, I was invited to speak in the Italian government a few days ago, and uh, it is important for us to bring uh, effective voices with us, you know. Not always, you know, it's not always easy. Uh, in the parliament it was, it was easier, they invited the people, but when we go to presentations, uh, we always make the case, you know, bring testimonials, bring testimonials. Very often they say, oh, we can just bring one woman from the organization, you have to talk about the model, uh, but you can show a testimonial on, uh, on film. It is very important that these women now take the, you know, have the floor, that they have, that they can address the international community directly, that they can, you know, so funding, you know, of uh, empowering this concerned and effective women is very, very important. Uh, for example, uh, Vicky Ibrahim, uh, we brought her to um, uh, this uh, Women in the World event uh, of Tina Brown uh, in New York. It's a huge event uh, in, the, in uh, the Lincoln Center, and uh, it is mostly about courageous stories. Uh, and uh, she got so much confidence from there. So we feel that if we would create now a speaker's, a speaker's um, community of these women, who, whose voices can be heard in international meetings and we can kind of bring them in uh, as our, you know, as, as credible voices from the ground, that would be very important to support these activities. Uh, to support, uh, adopt uh, mothers in mother schools so that they can uh, get going. Uh, some of the mothers really need uh, professional help, you know, need uh, therapy. This is also very important. And when you go through social services, um, you can get so so much uh, help. But very often, you know, to get to get hold of, uh, of psychotherapy, it costs money. So fundraising for the support of these women, fundraising for the visibility, fundraising for the rollout uh, is very important. We will have um, a presentation of the mother's schools here in Vienna on 8th of uh, March. I think it's uh, very much also an issue now of the, uh, for the International Women's Day. Uh, it will be hosted by the social ministry in the Ringturm. We will send you the invitations for the uh, meeting and we will bring uh, voices, women, we will bring the, the graduates uh, from the Vienna Mother Schools. Uh, there will be a small graduation ceremony. When did you start with this project? Uh, with this project in Europe, it was last year, mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in winter in December at the first meeting. 
and uh, 2013, it was in the other countries, 2013, we started the first mother schools. But the preparations went uh, on already. It started, I think, the whole idea started off with uh, Phyllis and Aisha, and then through our travels uh, across uh, uh, Palestine, Israel, with uh, these women who already created this uh, dialogue. 2008. That was 2008. We founded uh, the Safe Sisters Network 2008. And, um, and uh, now we are in all kind of networks, international mm -hmm. networks, uh, um, like the United States Institute for Peace is now uh, supporting the ongoing mother schools uh, outside of Europe. Uh, we hope it will continue, but uh, with their support we will go now to Indonesia and to Kashmir. Um, yeah, in, uh, we got the official support for the opening of the first round of mother schools in England through the so the prevent program, which is the official program of the Home Office in England. Mm -hmm. So I, I can see that it took time for the international community and for the countries to realize uh, the relevance of, uh, of these actors, you know, of, uh, of civil society involvement in, in, a, in a sustainable security buildup. Uh, and I'm quite confident that this will go now. And, uh, I hope that very soon we will be more people, we will have more capacity because the requests are increasingly uh, there. Mm -hmm. But we were very careful because we wanted not to invest too much in the overhead structure. We wanted to kind of streamline our activities and be sure that we can stay on board and can keep going, you know, and can keep uh, the mission forward. But now, you know, it's, uh, it's broadening and uh, Obviously, the whole problem around radicalization, foreign fighters, ISIS is not going to go away. Even if ISIS would go away, there would be another group, you know, which will follow ISIS. So I think there is little hope. Uh, there is a lot of distress, there is a lot of despair, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of failure of global leadership, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And um, for this reason, the voices from the ground are increasingly important. We, we have to kind of accelerate them and uh, bring them to the forefront. Just to follow up from what Mary last, um, I, I'm a technical writer and editor for the agency, and um, I will make sure that we have an article about today's meeting and also about your work. I'm sure you agree, Eva. Um, not only in our local newsletter, but in the WIN global newsletter. Unlike you, perhaps we're not quite so smart that you have um, your small uh, Frauen und Kvensen here in Vienna. If I understand you right, you don't have branches in other countries, but you work through existing structures and individuals. So um, what I would like to do is speak to you, the outreach person. Is that right? Sure. Yes. <laughs> um, and just get some of your own material. Yeah, that especially that links to films that we are about uh, allowed to use yeah. to um, publish in our newsletters and also in the agency staff journal. Yeah, that would be very, very helpful. Very yes, yeah. And I'll send you yeah. a copy of the article before yeah. it's published too, yeah. if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful idea. Yes, please, Janice. Okay, so I just wanted to say hello and introduce myself. I'm Janice So I get little bits and pieces of the stories, and, the, and I'm so curious about your organization and your cause, but I, I can't get a lot from him other than he has a place to go. Twice he's retired, so this is a really great project for him, but the, the, the whole concept is really appealing, you know, that's why I came here, and I wanted to encourage more to come to learn about this, you know, and, and you have already answered many of my questions about what can we do to help you, you know, and how do you, you know, sort of get out there in terms of your funding, in terms of your forums. And I, I know you you operate on a shoestring. There really is only four people that, that work there, which is totally amazing to me that you're able to kind of 
reach out and network and have these groups. And But somebody has to coordinate all that, too. I mean, in terms of all these mother groups and how you spin out and, and do these things. So I commend you for, for your initiative. I think it's a fantastic cause. I think it's so relevant in today's world. I'm so happy to hear about the fathers being sort of involved because you, when you think about the social structure of a family, it is the mother and the father's responsibility. And you think about the, the dynamics of, is it just boys going that way? No, it's boys and girls too. And so, you know, you need everybody in the family to be motivated, I think, to, to really, to, to, to kind of address this problem. But, you know, thank you for what you do. And I think it's just so important. And if there's ways that we can help you, I, I think people would be very interested in doing that. You know, so you really have to think about how you deploy, you know, interested people in your, in your efforts and in your cause. And because I, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Should we and with Absolutely. What we are creating now, and I think this is something uh, very female as well. We got so much caught up in our work that we did not look outside in work of in terms of the PR the enough, you know, this is this is, happens a lot. Um, and uh, there we are very self-critical at this stage where we are. And um, we are thinking now of creating this friends of women without borders. So that we have this second layer of friends who can, you know, in their capacities contribute. Like, I mean, your husband kind of fell from the skies through our, <laughs> for, through our board member uh, uh, who uh, works with UBS and she right. happened to meet him somewhere. So, uh, he was looking for something to do. Yes, he was looking for something to do. So uh, that was coincidental, you know, but I think, uh, and this is so helpful because we don't have the time, what he does, to go through all these funding mechanisms, the big foundations in the US, you know, we're constantly on, Skype with someone and you know, writing a proposal here and there and uh, hosting women. Uh, now going for two weeks, our whole team will go to uh, Indonesia because the Indonesian project is growing. And now the State Department contacted us and they said they want to bring the whole leadership from the from the American Embassy into the into the meeting we we have there. Our ambassador is bringing together the EU community. A huge chance, and uh, we are very excited that we have been approached by the Indonesian partners now to engage with police, train police, and bring in the teachers as well. So we are thinking now beyond the mother school to create this team shaping model around the mothers, which is fantastic. You know, this is really good, but you know, it takes so and so much energy. Yes. And uh, we have to think of uh, so like 24 hours in a day. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> the days are very full. <laughs> And we, we have to create these layers around and where uh, people, women uh, like you, uh, and there's so much capacity alone this room, you know, of outreach capacity and ideas uh, um, uh, that, you know, to see how we can, in, uh, can, can engage, you know, uh, all mm -hmm. the potential players. Uh, and it's, you know, I strongly, day by day, I feel it's not doing something, you know, it's not a charitable action, it's really now, it's about us, you know, how we look at each other, how we live together, how we make sure that this world, uh, I mean, at least stays as safe as it is with, with the raging wars around us, it's not a promise, but to contain the conflicts and help to, to, to solve them and find inroads, new inroads, I think this is the big challenge. So it's it's really about us now. Presentation, sorry, available. Uh, yeah. well, may we distribute the presentation yeah, sure, to the sure, people who sure. participate? Yeah. That's, That's one yeah. question. The other question, uh, Lily filmed the, the your speech, so. Uh, oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> I can't give permission. To <laughs> would Would you like to see it first? No. I would. I will not dis no. I put it on whatever. the open internet, but uh, just for, for people who participate. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm looking at the time, and unfortunately, we have to go back to our yeah, office to work here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we, we would still need, uh, need another session on, on uh, to discuss how we can really work uh, together in the future and how we can contribute because this is such such great things you are doing, yeah. and uh, I feel fully I, would, I feel excited <laughs> to no, be able to, to contribute. Thank you very much for giving us this. I'm really really happy. Uh, and 
I'm sure you know we can create synergies. Yes. And, uh, if there would be maybe a, a delegation, a small delegation, a working delegation, yes. so we could meet mm -hmm. and discuss that. It's an excellent idea. Yeah. It Let's do some brainstorming maybe yeah. amongst us. Yeah. And so so it would be one absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have some events coming up in Indiana. Too. And please Next. keep us posted about yeah. the yeah. events. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so, Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.